Hi, welcome to the signal pad. I have something really interesting to show you. This is a module from Fraunhofer. It's a frequency divider. And despite the fact that it's probably over 25 years old, it can divide frequencies all the way up to 30 gigahertz. Now at first, I just wanted to take it apart so we can take a look at the die, see how it is put together from an RF point of view. But then I thought maybe we should make this into a full tutorial. Talk about frequency dividers, static frequency dividers in particular, which is what's inside of this, their circuit topologies, their applications, and why they work the way they do. And then we can take a look inside of this and do an extensive measurement on how to characterize it because characterizing frequency dividers is this whole other game. Now I wanted to do this to give back again to the Patreon supporters who are continue to generously support the channel. The link is in the description if you want to also support the channel. None of the content I have ever made is behind the paywall and this is one of the reasons the Patreon supporters support the channel in the first place because they also want to support the community and want this knowledge to be available to everybody for free. So there's a lot of cool things to talk about this so let's get started. And here's our module. It looks really straightforward to use. We do have a power supply input plus and minus unregulated, which means that it most likely has voltage regulators on the inside of it. And we do have a single-ended clock input and a differential output, which is divided by two, zero to 30 gigahertz input frequency range and zero dBm power requirements. These are type K connectors, which will take us to 40 gigahertz in any case. There you go, if it would focus. There you go, it's the same as the input and the output. And it looks really nice. It's very large, so it's most likely built for many other applications, they're just using this chassis for this. But let's talk about frequency dividers, topologies, learn a little bit about the theory before we start experimenting with this. Now I'm going to here borrow Professor Lee's slides over here from National U Taiwan University because they're simple and they get the point across. Bear with me while we talk about this because it's going to make the rest of our conversation and the measurements and the analysis of those modules a lot more meaningful. Now pretty much any circuit that you touch is going to have frequency dividers in it, a variety of configurations and frequency ranges. And that's because most circuits are going to have PLLs in them, a phase lock loop of some kind. Now imagine that you want to build a PLL where the VCO operates at tens of gigahertz. The very first thing that VCO is going to see is going to be some kind of a divider. And that's because you don't want to build a phase frequency detector at the full rate of the VCO, that wouldn't make any sense. And plus, you have a reference that's much lower in frequency than the VCO, so you're going to have to put them in a phase frequency detector of the same frequency, of course. And this is pretty important, because this frequency divider, you don't want it to degrade the phase noise in any significant way. You don't want it to have additive phase noise. You want it to basically be an ideal divider. Now, I know that I've talked about making a tutorial about PLLs. We'll eventually get there, but at least this way we have some tutorial on the dividers to begin with. I've also done a full tutorial on phase noise, and there you will understand from that the relationship between the phase noise of what happens when you divide a signal and what phase noise is in general. In that situation, the signal coming out can be used, for example, in a full-time retimer, and that situation you're going to get your eye cleaned up. Now, that's a typical broadband transmitter is going to have this flip-flop at the very end. This flip-flops, again, remember, can operate at 100 gigabit per second, for example. And on the receive side, if you have a CDR, you're going to get some recovered clock from that CDR. And then if you want to demux your signal down to, let's say, from 100 gigabit per second to four channels of 25, you're going to have to use demuxes. And those demuxes are going to continue to need divided frequency clocks in order to be able to operate. And they all need to be coherently synced together. And the frequency dividers are often used exactly for this purpose. So even in this very basic transmit receive broadband system, you have multiple dividers in strategic places. You can also play some tricks using frequency dividers for IQ transmitters. The nice thing about a frequency divider is, once you look at this architecture, it actually generates two signals internally, which are I and Q 90 degrees out of phase. So if you have a VCO, for example, running at, let's say, 50 gigahertz, and you want to create a super heterodyne down converted in this situation where your IF mixers are running at half the frequency, but their image rejection, you can actually use the divided frequency and generate zero and 90 degrees and use them on the mixers. So this is also a common technique that is often used. There are a lot of other ways to generate IQ clock signals and LO signals, but this is a really nice way because it generates very uh, nearly perfect IQ signals going into your mixers. So static dividers, which is the type of divider we're going to talking about today, is fundamentally, in principle, really simple. All you have is a flip-flop, whose output is fed back to the input with the reverse polarity. This means that every time you have the clock signal coming out, the signals at the D and Q ports of the flip-flop toggle at half the rate. So on every rising edge, you're going to get, and every rising edge of the clock, you're going to get a toggle on the signal coming out which means that it's going to divide the signal by a factor of two. So really straightforward. You can build this with basic CMOS circuits if you want to. That's one of the reasons it's called static dividers. But unfortunately, the regular CMOS is not going to cut it. 
If you want to go very, very high frequency, we have to do exactly the same thing to the flip-flop and the latch as we do to anything else. We're going to have to make them in current mode. It turns into a current mode logic type of circuitry. So the question is, and what is the schematic that we can use to turn this into a realistic, realizable CML circuit? So a flip-flop is of course made of two latches. So first thing we need to do is to design a CML latch. Now, a CML latch is a remarkably simple structure. All you have is basically six transistors. So at the bottom you have a current source. This current source can also be made of a transistor, of course. And then you have the clock signals applied to the transistors M5 and M6. Now for a moment, imagine that this clock signal is high, which means the clock bar is low. In that case, this transistor is fully turned off. And therefore, there is no current at all in this side of the circuit. It completely turns off. And then all you have is just a CML inverter or a CML buffer. The signal VN is the digital signal that you're interested in. So DN goes out and it just comes out of the other side, but amplified by the gain of this amplifier. And if everything is in limiting mode, is in large signal, you just basically get the output following the input, perhaps with the reverse polarity, depending on the reference you're defining. So in that situation, all you have is something that follows the input. Nothing special there, but that's how you load the latch, and that's how you get the latch to basically remember what the next stage is. Now imagine that we go back and we flip the order of this. This time we're going to bring the clock signal low, and now we can make the clock bar signal high. Now during this transition from one side to the other, the current ISS transitions from transistor M5 into transistor M6. And remember that this output over here has the polarity and the signal from the input being applied to it just before. In that situation, transistor M3 and M4 are in positive feedback, and they latch, they snap onto one side, depending on which voltage was high and which voltage was low, and then as soon as this current is now fully inside of this side, this guy completely turns off, isolating the input from the output completely, and this guy latches and keeps the signal. And that's how a CML latch works. Now, of course, you're right to immediately notice that if the clock is transitioning at the same time as Vin is transitioning, you're not going to get a reliable output, and that's true. And therefore, you always have to make sure that your clock signal is transitioning somewhere after the input voltage has already been settled and defined. This is a problem for any latch, of course, not just for the CMR latch. You have this sensitivity that's set up, and the whole time you need to ma make sure that those are met, and this is exactly the same situation here. Now, if you think about this, if I, const if I make the clock signal faster and faster and faster, or the input signal faster, eventually I'm not going to be able to toggle the output of this latch anymore, and this positive feedback is not going to latch the signal anymore, and therefore you're limited by the RC time constant of the circuit. Just like any other CML circuit, you're going to eventually not be able to toggle the output at the rate of the input that you're interested in. So now that we know how to build a latch, we can just put two of them in a row and close the loop around them, and you will get a flip-flop. So how would that look like? Well, here's the latch we were just talking about. You can put another one right after it, take its output, bring it back to the input, flip the polarity, and apply the clock to both of them in opposite polarity, and there is your static divider. Now, there is an entire different category of dividers called dynamic dividers, for which you have a low-pass filter and a self-mixing, where you get rid of the uh, upper sideband of the signal. We're going to talk about that in a totally different video. This is a whole other topic of how these circuits work. Just for now, keep in mind that there is an entire other way of building dividers, and the dynamic dividers actually tend to work at a higher frequency, but they are also a bit harder to design, and they don't go as low in frequency. They're not as broadband as the static dividers. A static divider, in theory, can go all the way down to DC, basically, in division. Now, when you put two latches in a row and close the loop from the output to the input, some interesting things begin to happen. So here's two latches. Now note that the clock transistors are not drawn, and it's making some particular assumption. Imagine that the clock signal is not present, and all the clock transistors are biased at the same level. In that situation, what happens with those clock transistors now basically turn themselves into current sources. So you have the current sources for where the clock signal would be. So what does this look like? Well, this looks like basically a bunch of CML inverters in a row. So you have one CML inverter, then you have a latching pair at the output, and then another one, another latching pair, and then the output goes back to the input. Well, this is basically like a ring oscillator. So if this meets the criteria for oscillation, which it will, you're going to get some self-oscillation. This is called the self-resonance frequency or the free-running frequency of a static divider. All static dividers do this if you bias their clock signals at the constant level. It's because there are CML circuits. In that situation, you get this interesting behavior. When this thing is oscillating at its free-running frequency, if you apply a clock frequency, then it's going to require very little clock amplitude 
for it to continue doing its division. But as you move away from its free running frequency, you're going to have to apply a stronger and stronger clock signal in order to pull it away from its natural free running frequency. So what people do is that they design their static divider and bring this self-resonance frequency or self-oscillation frequency close to where they want the maximum frequency of this to be or at least close to where they want to operate it. In that situation, you will have a reliable divider with a small amount of clock signal so that you can make sure under temperature and process variation, you will always achieve a good division from these static dividers. This is a fundamental design technique used on static dividers. Now at the same time, this also means that if you're really pushing the behavior, you're really pushing the frequency of operation as high as you can, the self-resonance frequency tends to be towards the highest side, towards the highest uh, possible. And you will see this over and over again with static dividers, and we will see this when we measure our own static divider. But there's a couple of other papers that people have experimented and have built variety of static dividers, and I think it's worthwhile to take a look at them to see how other people have thought about this. And also, I think I may have found a paper by Fraunhofer, which is very similar to the static divider we're going to be looking at. So here's a paper that I picked randomly just to show you that these things have been done f at very high frequencies even very long time ago. This is a paper from Patrick Reynard. Uh, he was a professor at KU Leuven, and this is a 60 gigahertz static divider with only 15.7 milliwatts in 90 nanometer CMOS. And this paper is considered old by, of course, the standards today. This is from 2010. But if you look at, you go down, you can see that they have two flip-flops in a row, and that's going to achieve a divide by four, because you have divide by two from the first one, divide by two from the second one, and the loop, internal loop is not shown on this diagram, it's assumed to be there. If you go down, look at the schematic, check it out. This is exactly the same schematic we were talking about. A few d minor differences here is that they don't have any additional current sources here at the bottom of the clock transistor, so the clock transistors are running in pseudo-differential, not fully differential, and they do this because they want to save headroom and not have to run the power supply at a higher voltage and not run these devices potentially into breakdown. This is a 9 nanometer process. And if you notice also, they have inductors in series with their resistive load, and that's because they're using series inductive peaking, of course. And series inductive peaking is used to extend the bandwidth of CMR circuits. So this all makes sense. Now here, this figure title and this figure title are identical. I think that's just an error. This should really say that this is a latch. But nonetheless, so we have these two, and if you go down, let's see if there is any measurement. It's very nice dye photos here. But if you look, look at that. That's the sensitivity curve, exactly what we were expecting. What did we say? We said that people, when they want to push the frequency, they normally get their self-resonance close to the operation. That's exactly what is happening over here. This is going to be the best frequency to operate this. As you go away from the self-resonance frequency, you're going to need more and more input power at the clock port in order to achieve division. This matches theory almost perfectly, and it's exactly what you would expect from these kind of circuits. If I go down, there is here's a divide by 4. You can see that the sensitivity of the divide by 4 is shifted a little bit lower, and that's because the first divider needs to drive the second divider. That's probably why they have a slightly worse uh, performance here from the second, from divide by 4. And that's it. And I think this it really is from 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Somewhere here at the bottom, the date was mentioned. There it is, 2010. Yep, so that's already a long time ago. And here's something at even higher frequency. This is from Zach Griffith and Professor Mark Rodwell from UC Santa Barbara. Now this one is a 250 nanometer indium phosphate HPT version of this. And look at that, this frequency is 204 gigahertz. And even this is actually also from around 2010. So these are pretty, pretty old papers, but nonetheless, achieving 200 and 4 gigahertz of static division is pretty impressive, but the indium phosphate HPD process is also really fast. Now I'm not going to go through this, it's a very nice presentation with details on how this design, but one thing I wanted to show you is the way it's laid out. This schematic of the two latches are drawn the way they are laid out in the actual ASIC, and that's important because the local loopback, if you notice, is handled in the middle, and that means that that loop is very short. If you make that loop long, you cause a delay in the loop, and that delay in the loop will limit the maximum frequency you can divide. So this is a clever way of laying this out. You can see these are now HPTs, they're not MOSFETs, but the topology is essentially exactly the same. There's really not so many ways you can build a latch uh, in a CML topology. So that's pretty impressive to see. Now this process, it looks like it's a 400 gigahertz FT, 650 gigahertz F max, and if you notice, if you can get your divider to reach FT over two, roughly, that's pretty good. And in the other paper, in the Patrick Reynolds paper, 
this I believe the FD was and here it is, you can see the FD is 150 gigahertz. We're operating around you know, 70 gigahertz or so, just under FD over two. So getting close to this number is pretty difficult. So this one, they've certainly achieved that. And I think this paper has some really nice dye photos. You can see the, the two latches here at the top, here at the top and the bottom. Interesting that there are no particular inductors in this one. Doesn't seem to be picked, but it does have transmission lines which they may be using for that purpose. And here's the paper from Fraunhofer, which I think points to at least very close to the dyes and the ASICs that are inside of this module. I look at that, a 31 gigahertz static divider and a 39 gigahertz dynamic divider. And this, as you can see, the dynamic divider, again, frequency is higher than the static one. And this is in a 0.2 micron aluminum gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide hemp process. Really old. I think this paper is from the mid-90s. And if you go down here, look at that. FT is 60. And look, we're achieving about FD over 2 in static frequency divider, which means it's very good. It's getting close to that value. I'm not sure if people have shown how much higher than FD over 2, but I think reliably this is what you would expect. And here's a circuit. This has a lot of source followers in a row, which is common for these hemps, but in reality you have a latch here and a latch here and a loop back from the output to the input. The clock is single-ended going in, <coughs> exactly like our module that's also single-ended. The other side is self-biased internally. So this gives me hope that this is probably very similar to what we have in our module, and the output is differential. And here's also a dynamic version of that divider. And if you go down, let's see, here's the sensitivity curve. Look, it has exactly similar shape. This must be for the dynamic one because it's higher in frequency, but very similar behavior. And here's a die for that. Now, I'm not sure if the die is going to look exactly the same because what the product is probably different than what's in this paper, but this tells us a lot more already. So the stack divider is the one here on the right side. So this is all very nice. So hopefully you got a good idea of roughly what we we're talking about when we we're looking at this. Let's go now and play with our module and see if it's consistent with everything we learned here. So let's go ahead and measure this frequency divider to see if it works at all and see how much it matches our intuition that we developed by looking at various static divider architectures as well as how they're supposed to operate. Now we can look at the output of the divider on a spectrum analyzer in the frequency domain, of course, and that will tell us if it's dividing by looking at the spectrum at the input and the output. But this does have a differential output, and looking at a divider's output in the time domain does give us some additional information, especially when you're looking at the differential signal and in general just the shape of the waveform. Now that we, for that, you're going to need a oscilloscope that, of course, can capture and show frequencies up to and beyond 15 gigahertz. And for that, I'm going to use the Rodenshore's RTP series oscilloscope, 16 gigahertz for channel, 40 giga sample per second. This is a fantastic oscilloscope. It has a lot of features and it deserves its own episode. But for now, we're going to use it to capture these two time domain signals. And of course, we can also look at the spectrum by using a Fourier transform built onto this. The two outputs of the divider are using a matched cable so that the phase matched and they're going into channel one and channel three. So we can use the highest samplings rate of the RTP, and there is a converter in here, which is a special converter that can go from a type K directly into the BNC-like inputs of the oscilloscope. Now on the other side, we have another coaxial cable going in, which is our input frequency, and for that, we're going to use a Rodenshure's SMP04, which is a 40 gigahertz synthesizer, a fairly old unit by the standards of today, and of course, we're going to use the, the great NGP800 power supply to power the whole thing, and that's really all we need to get this setup up and running. We can do a few things. We can start by just powering it on and looking at the self-resonance frequency and then looking at what happens when we actually apply an input clock. Let's give it a try. So here we are, let's see what we have here. So the circuit is connected to the oscilloscope as you just saw. There is no power supply and there is no clock signal. Now what do we expect when I apply power? Well, if the divider is working, we would expect to see its self-oscillation frequency. And we can get a lot of information by observing that and seeing how it behaves. So the clock is off, I'm gonna turn on the power supply set to plus or minus 10 volts. Here it is, and look at that. We do get a nice differential output. Now, this signal on channel 2 is a little bit larger than channel 1. This may be due to so, some asymmetry of the circuit itself. This is, again, an aluminum gallium arsenide process. It's pretty old, and the unit is also pretty old. But nonetheless, it looks pretty nice. Now, let's look at the frequency of it. So the amplitude is 500 millivolt uh, is from channel 2, and the frequency is 16 gigahertz. So it is self-oscillating near the highest frequency it should be able to divide to begin with. So this is rated to a 30 gigahertz input, which would be a 15 gigahertz output, and it's self-oscillating at 16 gigahertz at its output. Now this is a really common strategy. It means that the designers have pushed this circuit as high as they could. 
in order to get the highest divi division frequency from it. And typically what happens in that situation is that the delays around the loop are optimized for the highest frequency, and that is 16 gigahertz. It means that this circuit should be able to divide 32 gigahertz with the minimum input frequency. In order to do this, the disadvantage of designing like this is that for lower frequency division, I need a larger input signal to make the division work. But that's okay, because at those frequencies, it's easier to generate a high signal anyway. So that's exactly what we were expecting to see from the sensitivity curve of these dividers. So they really have pushed it as far as they could. So right now, there is no inputs. Let's take a look at the spectrum and see what that spectrum looks like. Here we go. And this RTP scope from Northern Shores, by the way, is ridiculously fast. You look at this compute, all these FFTs without any issues. So here we go, here's our tone, and it is sitting right around 16 gigahertz, and then the noise flow drops very rapidly. That's to be expected because this oscilloscope is only rated to 16 gigahertz to begin with. This is just a noise of the scope going down. So it looks nice, but what do we expect from the self-oscillation? We expect this to be very bad for phase noise because this is just an internal circuit oscillating and it does not have any high quality factors that let's say you would find in a typical culprit oscillator or other kinds of oscillators so the phase noise would be very bad but it is self-oscillating and we can find out well we can apply a 32 gigahertz input exactly which means the output frequency should change only a little bit but the phase noise should change a lot as it would follow then the phase noise of the input signal rather than following its own internally generated phase noise. Let's try that. I'm going to apply 32 gigahertz at plus 10 dBm, and there you go. Look at that. Did you see how much the skirt moved down? Let's try again. You can see how much the noise floor around the tone actually changes. It's a significant, significant reduction in phase noise, exactly what we would expect from the theory operation of static dividers. Now I'm going to turn the spectrum off so we can see it in the time domain, although in the time domain this would not be very obvious. Here we go. Right now, clock is applied. Frequency is 16 gigahertz. I'm going to turn the clock off. See, we don't really see much of a difference in the waveform, although it does seem to be a le less uh, symmetric, actually, with the input being applied. But look at that. So yeah, you really do need to look at it in the spectrum domain to make sure that it is working correctly. Well, let's go back to the spectrum for a second. And let's reduce the input frequency. So we're still applying plus 10 dBm, which is large. As if I go down with one gigahertz at a time, you can see that the input divided signal very nicely follows. That is very, very good. So here you go. Let's stop here at 20 gigahertz. And let's turn this off so we can see the waveform. Here it is our waveform in the time domain. Looks very nice. 10 gigahertz, exactly as expected. Now, if I turn off the clock, it would jump immediately back to its self-oscillation frequency. Look, here you go. No clock. Turn the clock on locks immediately to 20 gigahertz. Now we can find out what the sensitivity of it is at a 20 gigahertz input, because we should be able to reduce the input clock up until it cannot divide anymore. Let's try that. So we write plus 10 dBm. Here is 5 dBm, still nothing, divides no problem. Here is 0 dBm, still dividing. Oh, it's beginning to lose a little bit. There you go, right here. At minus 4 dBm, it quite cannot lock to the input anymore. So it's struggling. And if I look at the spectrum, I would see, I should see a whole bunch of tones in different frequencies. And in fact, I do. And it is struggling to jump around uh, between trying to lock to 10 gigahertz and of course its own self resonance. It's doing some mixing products between the two. It's just a mess. And this is how you measure the sensitivity curve. You basically have to do this experiment at every single input frequency, go sweep the input power, get exactly the, the, the power for which it divides correctly, plot that curve, and voila, you get the sensitivity curve of the static divider. Now if I go up here, 5 dBm, look at that, immediately locks at, at a minus 3, here's minus 4, yeah, every time it's going to look a little bit different because it's really at the edge, <laughs> it looks really funny, look at that, that is a mess. And if I go down, eventually, if I keep reducing the power, it slowly approaches its self-oscillation frequency and it goes back to where it was. So it all really works and it looks really nice. So let's go back to really strong signal here, plus 10 dBm, nicely locked. Let's go back to the time domain here. Let's look at the shape of the waveform as we reduce the input signal. So here's frequency, we go down, here's 10 gigahertz, now it's producing a 5 gigahertz output. Now let me go all the way to, let's say, 2 gigahertz. So at 2 gigahertz, we should see a nice square wave, a lot of bandwidth here available. 1 gigahertz comes out, 2 gigahertz goes in. Now this doesn't mean 
that these waveforms are not square-like even at higher frequencies because remember you need harmonics of this frequency to see actually the square wave and the only way to do that is the scope needs to have the bandwidth but this scope has only 16 gigahertz and I say only here lightly and as a result you will not see for example a 10 gigahertz signal looking like a square wave it's just not possible so let's go here to a 20 gigahertz input and you can see at the 20 gigahertz input the signal does look much more sinusoidal because the next harmonics would be at 20, 30, and so on, and we cannot measure those anyway. But I do plan to connect this to the subsampling oscilloscope and see if this is square at all. That would be an interesting experiment in itself. So let's go back to here 32 gigahertz. And in, at 32 gigahertz, I can do exactly the same thing and find out when the sensitivity breaks. I think we need to look at the spectrum a little bit closer. Okay, so here's a zoomed in version. Right now, I don't have the clock applied and you can see the skirts around the tone, which are the phase noise. I'm gonna apply the 20 gigahertz input. Look at that. Look at how much of a difference this makes in terms of the phase noise. We have to measure that separately. So right now I'm applying 10 dBm at 32 gigahertz. So let's back off that power and see at what point it's no longer able to divide. So here's zero dBm. Here's minus 10 dBm. If you remember at 20 gigahertz, I needed plus 4 dBm in order for this to work. Now at minus 10, and it still works, which makes sense because we are right at the self-oscillation. We have the highest, uh, the, the lowest level of sensitivity required to make this work. There you go. At minus 12, it stops. So yeah, big difference. And it's really confused at this. And go back to minus 11, minus 12, minus 11, minus 12. Yep, it makes perfect sense. If I turn it off altogether, it goes back to this. So all of this matches our theory almost perfectly. And that's to be expected because static dividers are really well studied. There's a huge amount of literature, as you saw, available on it. Now, if you want to see the real shape of the signal that's coming out of this device, we're going to need a lot more bandwidth. And here I'm setting everything up using the Keysight DCA-X. And I do have the remote heads connected here. These remote heads do have about 75 or 80 gigahertz of bandwidth and subsampling mode, of course. So we should be able to get a good faithful reproduction of the waveform shape. Now this setup is going to be a lot more complicated because we do need to clock DCAX with a precision type-based reference. And that's in fact exactly what something like this was even made for in the first place, for laboratory use, because precision time-based have a limited frequency range. The one that I have over here, this is the Agilent 861007A, and that one can only go up to 20 gigahertz. Now the difference in the price of a 20 gigahertz precision time base or a 40 gigahertz precision time base is huge. So if you can afford to buy only a 20 gigahertz one, you can use a divider in order to bring your frequency of your system within the input range of the precision time base. And this is very common in broadband measurements and optical measurements, where you basically have a system with a very high frequency and you need to divide it down in order to use those divisions as references or clock sources for other parts of your system. And this is a good example of that. So in this situation, we have 20 gigahertz coming in to our divider, and we have 10 gigahertz coming out. That 10 gigahertz goes into one of the remote heads, and the other 10 gigahertz out is used to clock the precision time base. Now, as a result, everything is locked together, and we should be able to see the exact shape of the waveform coming out of the divider. Now, don't also forget that the interface from the divider into the remote head is also pretty important, because if this is a low-pass filter, because you don't have a very high-frequency cable or attenuators, you're going to see again the same thing we were seeing on the oscilloscope. So here I'm using a K to V converter cable. This cable does have 50 or 60 gigahertz of bandwidth, and I am using a 67 gigahertz attenuator at the input to protect this. And this entire interface therefore has at least 50 gigahertz of bandwidth. This should be no problem to measure the square wave at 10 gigahertz. So right now the divider is turned on and it's self-oscillating. But in that mode, you cannot capture that waveform using a DCAX, the subsampling oscilloscope. The clock coming out is not stable enough to lock the precision time base to. So I'm going to go ahead and apply the 20 gigahertz. I'm going to enable the 20 gigahertz signal. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to tell the precision time base what the frequency is and I'm going to reset that so it would lock to that frequency for me. And there it is, it does. And look at that, this is a 10 gigahertz signal coming out of the divider. And it looks very different from what we were looking at on the Rodenschwarz RTP. Here we have so much more bandwidth, we can indeed see that there's a lot of other harmonics present in the frequency content of this. And we do see a much more square wave, which is nice. It means that they really did have done a good job in order to maintain the high frequency content. It does have a lot of overshoot and undershoot, which is the result of them really pushing the circuit. And this is just a compromise they have made. But for the purposes, I think it works. Now we can go into the eye mask mode over here and look at the amount of jitter. 
Now, if you look at this jitter, it says it's 170 femtosecond. This value is actually incorrect. And the reason is because I'm using the same circuit to clock the precision time base as I am to measure the jitter. So they're correlated. And as a result, they basically subtract from each other. And what you're reading is the noise floor, the jitter floor of the DCAX, which is the model that I have is in fact is 150 femtosecond. The new models of the DCAX are well below this, which is extraordinary when you think about the inherent jitter of an instrument to be so tiny. But you do need that if you're going to build circuits that are going to operate at 200 gigawatt which is what everybody's working on in the optical coherent domain. So if you look at this then, that tells us that, well, we can use this reasonably well for a lot of clocking applications in these kind of circuits. Now this is very, very low frequency today, but back then when this was built, this was pretty much the state of the art. And you could build 40 gigabit per second uh, circuits and so on, which was all the rage back about 20 years ago. And we should also verify that the divider does indeed reduce the phase noise by 6 dB when it divides the frequency by two. Now normally dividers are supposed to do that, that's just a theoretical consequence of having half as many zero crossings when you divide by two. But of course there's additional noise that they add to the circuit. So if the input phase noise to the divider is, let's say, very high, then dividing it by a factor of two is pretty easy because you're dealing with a lot of phase noise to begin with. But if you reduce the input phase noise to a certain level, then the internal additional noise generated by the circuit will dominate and that difference of 6 dB will no longer be present. So in this case, let's try measuring the phase noise at the input and output of the divider. At the top, I have the Azure MXG, which is a pretty low phase noise source. So we'll see if that's going to give us a 6 dB we expect. And of course, we have the E5052B, which is a signal source analyzer, and we should be able to measure the phase noise with that. Right now, first, we have to directly connect the output of the MXG into the input of the signal analyzer so we can me measure the raw phase noise of our source and then we'll do, the, do it again through the divider and we can keep both of those measurements on the screen at the same time even though there are two different frequencies. Let's try it out. So here's a reference phase noise measurement. This is a 6 gigahertz signal directly from the MXG. 2.5 dBm of power is arriving at our measurement instrument here. Now the shape of this phase noise is very much the shape we would expect from something like the MXG's internal PLA. It drops very quickly at higher offsets and we're measuring from 100 hertz to 100 megahertz offset and at these very high offsets we're basically noise for limited and you look at this shape and we're going to store this in memory i'm using 10 correlations and 16 averaging to get this so we're going to keep exactly the same setting except that here in the trace we're going to put this trace into memory so we can then compare it and here's the phase noise of the output of the divider you can see the frequency is now at 3 gigahertz the power is a lot less because i still have the same attenuator in the way so if i go under the trace here i can actually enable both of these to be displayed at the same time. I look at that, that's the difference between them. Now each of these is 5 dB divisions on the vertical axis and it looks pretty close to 6. Now measuring this difference is actually very difficult because you have to apply some very careful cross-correlation techniques to subtract them. The powers need to be the same here, the powers aren't exactly the same. So I'm skeptical that we would get exactly 6 dB. But nonetheless, let's do a math here. There it is, look at that. And if you look at this, it's sitting at around a minus 5. It sometimes goes a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower, but yeah. So we're getting about a 5 dB of difference. Right around, let's say, about 10 kilohertz of offset, we had minus 5.1 dB difference between the two. And if I go higher here, at around a, maybe a megahertz of offset, indeed we have minus 5.8 dB C per hertz difference. So that's pretty close. And at lower frequencies, of course, harder, you need more cross-correlation to get this measurement. Now, once you go past this, at around, let's say, 10 megahertz offset, the difference is only minus 2. But don't be fooled by this, because this has to do with the noise floor. You're basically just measuring the noise floor of the instrument, so the difference is not going to be necessarily 6, unless you have enough power and enough dynamic range to make that measurement. But this, is, this does not represent the capability of the divider necessarily. This is more of an instrumentation limitation. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty close to minus 6. Looks good. So Pooch wants to make sure that we do some thermal analysis on the module and so we can see the effect on temperature on the self-oscillation frequency. So the theory tells us that if we can make our transistors faster, we're going to be able to increase the self-oscillation frequency of our static divider. So here I've mounted the module on a Peltier cooler device. So we have on one side a heat sink with a fan on it and a Peltier device in the middle. So this plate is going to get cold below ambient temperature. So we should be able to chill the device a little bit. Now this is going to only maybe bring the temperature down by 20 or 30 degrees Celsius. It's not going to be a huge amount, but we should see some improvement, hopefully in the self-oscillation. Okay, and here's our setup to visualize this effect. Here we have our divider running in self-oscillation mode. There's nothing connected to the input. And one of the output is going into this HP 53158. 
which is a frequency counter. So right now in free running, of course, we're looking at a self-oscillation frequency at the output of about 14.6 gigahertz, which is fine. Right now the pulse shear cooler is not running, so this is basically sitting at ambient temperature. If I let it run for a while, it might drop a little bit because it's going to heat up, although the power consumption of it is quite low. So then I'm going to turn on now the pulse shear cooler, and we're going to wait. It will take some time before we see any change in the frequency because there's a lot of thermal mass here, but this is going to cool below ambient. So let's find out what happens. Here we go after some time, we gained only about 100 megahertz or so in the self-oscillation frequency. But remember that this shifts the entire sensitivity curve up, so we most likely are able now to divide a little bit of bigger range at the input. Certainly 100 megahertz here translates to at least 200 megahertz at the input, but it, it will probably work even higher than that. And this is limited to how much I can cool it, and it's probably cooled at about maybe about 10 degrees Celsius or 7 degrees Celsius. If you cool it more aggressively, you will get even more. So here's the bottom of the module where the actual DC supplies go in and we see two running our voltage regulators. Now this is to be expected. We definitely don't want to use DC-DC converters here despite their improved efficiency because you don't want to put any noise into the actual divider. In case you want to use it for anything sensitive, you definitely don't want to pollute that. And at the same time, these linear regulators will also further isolate the power supply noise. You'll have a better, better power supply rejection coming from this. It looks like they're adjustable here and here probably just adjusting it to the frequency and some thin wires going to the other side. There's nothing unusual on this side, but it is interesting that they're using these tiny wires to go to the other side and eventually connect it to the circuit. So when we turn it around, we should be able to see those. But these are too thick to be directly connected to the diode. They must be doing some change around. Let's take a look at the other side. And here's the other side. And the mystery of how they're connecting those coaxial to the module is now answered is because they're using micro coax cables. This is obviously not the cheapest way to do it, but it is certainly the highest performance. And since cost does not seem to be much of an issue here, it allows them to use a very large container from multiple different designs and then just simply use these micro coaxial connections to come to the center. The thin wires come out from the other side. You can see them and there's indeed some transition and then they go into one board and then ultimately the die. So there's multiple layers of assembly required here to make this work. Now we need to put this under the microscope so we can see closely this little carrier board and then even closer to see the tiny little die that's in the center. But from this view, we can get a good idea on how they connect this entire module to the actual coaxial connectors from the outside. And you can see these micro coaxes coming very close to this carrier board. And this carrier board it just allows you to fan out the sensitive RF inputs and outputs of this die to these coaxial connections. This is a very expensive packaging method, especially going to this connectors here, but again, these are in low volume. They're not intended to be cheap. They're intended to just work at the highest performance possible. This is silver epoxy all around here. And then if I pull this a little bit, you can see that here they convert this to a thicker wire, which goes to the other side where we saw the voltage regulators. Now on this module over here, I'm not sure what this is made of, but you know, some RF board, nothing interesting there. And you can see these traces here. They're just basically transmission lines. This gap that you see to the other side is much bigger and the thickness of the substrate. So these are basically transmission lines and the coplanar waveguide aspect of the lines is probably pretty weak given the distances. Once they get closer, it's a little bit different though. It's also interesting that it looks like there is silver epoxy where the wire bonds meet this carrier, which is a little bit unusual. I wonder why they've done that, maybe just to make it really solid, but this is clearly all done by hand. And this is IF, that's of course a uh, Fraunhofer, and then Tyler, I believe, in, in German for divider. 1 to 2S for static, so 1 to 2 divider. It all makes sense. Now, in order to really understand how this works, we need to look at the die a bit closer. We can also then see, hopefully, the wire bonds a little bit better. But this solves the mystery of how they go to these coaxial connections. You can also see that they have drilled here some cavity for this thing to sit in, so probably just so that it would sit just low enough uh, that it, this would make a good connection with the coax. So it all looks good. Now let's put another big microscope and take a look at the dye. And here is our dye under the microscope. This microscope really does produce absolutely stunning images. This is times 100, and I can't really magnify anymore because the module is pretty thick and it would collide with the other lenses, and I don't want to remove them because it's good to not to handle them as much as possible as they're very fragile, and if you drop them, it will be the end of that. So here we have on the left side the input, you can see the traces we saw on that carrier board. And interestingly enough, they do have silver epoxy where the wire bonds meet those traces. I wonder if it's because they didn't have good adhesion and they had to add that. That's a lot of extra work. And on the other side, of course, we have our die. We have ground, signal ground, and that's normal. 
and we do have a much, much smaller signal path, which is also normal. You want to minimize this capacitance as much as possible. There's some asymmetry here. We do have the ground connected to the plane at the top, but not at the bottom. And that's partially because this is off-center. And that's because this is a self bias circuit, a single ended input. And that's probably what they've done that to minimize the input length over here. And then after that, of course, we're going to have our latches. If you look at the layout of this latch, if I look closely, I think it's just latch one followed by latch two, rather than having one latch at the top and one latch at the bottom, as we saw in some of the example publications. Uh, that circuit may have a better way of interconnection and faster, lower turnaround time delay around the loop, but it, it may be very difficult to do that with only the two metal layers you have in this aluminum gallium arsenide process. But if you look closely, you can see if this is the output of the uh, final latch, the differential output, if you follow it on this side, you go here, and then you jump across, you go over there, you come back, and on the other one, you go this way, and you go the opposite side, and you go back. And I think that's the, the basically the loop back, the part where they make the feedback across. And then once the two latches end, we do have an apple buffer, and this apple buffer will just drive our 50 ohm. That's really important to have this, because if you don't have this, and you want to connect directly from the latch to the output, you make this entire static divider be hostage to whatever is connected to the other side. And depending on the impedance, you would actually change the behavior and the self-oscillation frequency of this. And in order to completely buffer this from the outside, you do want to have a buffer over here, and this will also increase the amplitude. Note how the inductors are much, much larger than the inductors over here. That's because this is operating at half the frequency, so you, you do need a larger inductor to do the same inductive peaking technique. And then each latch has two inductors as well. These are CML logic, of course, so two at the top two at the bottom. It all makes sense. It all comes together nicely. These inductors do produce that extra overshoot, especially if you really want to push the circuit aggressively with shunt peaking, which I think is what's going on over here. And that's the price to pay, but then it does operate at a higher frequency. And then at the output over here, we do have ground, signal, ground, signal, ground. Similar pad architecture, except that this does have some connections to the plane as to be expected. And then there is, of course, biasing at the top and the bottom. And it's difficult to get this kind of performance, as we talked about, from a process that's actually reaching almost half of its FT. That's pretty impressive, and it's a very difficult task. They've done a really good job from Fraunhofer, as to be expected. And the other side, we just go through our traces as well. Let's see what else we can say here. Well, one of the reasons this text here is a little bit out of focus, and that's because this chip isn't entirely flat. And I did make a video on how I do focus stacking to get the entire thing in focus. In this case, this is a live image, so it's not running uh, focus stacking, but you can check that video as well. If you also look carefully, you will notice that this die is beginning to develop some defects. This line over here and this line over here are in the same. That's because this looks like it's kind of peeling off. This is still going to work because we do have some electrical connection, and this one might still have an electrical connection too. There's also some peeling happening here too. This is actually surprisingly common, even in modern semiconductors, gallium arsenide, for example, or gallium nitride, they can peel off, especially the top layer, and sometimes people even fix them, uh, because the feature size is so large in this particular design, for example. But hopefully this will last a lot longer, even though this is happening, I don't know when this must have happened. And aside from that, I think the rest of it looks pretty clear. We can zoom down, and we can see the traces, and yes, indeed, silver epoxy all around. They probably didn't have good adhesion. That's why they've done this. Let's go back to focusing here again. Now I can change the microscope's optics a little bit and you can see how we can use that technique to really bring out this failure. So here in dark field, some of the top traces are a lot easier to see and the feedback from the output of the latch to the input of the latch also becomes a little bit more obvious. So here it is, this one side, you can see goes all the way back and here is the other side, which this side actually jumps underneath this trace, which you cannot see anymore, and the other side goes all the way back here. So I think that that kind of makes sense. And now this piece um, is brighter it, because it reflects light much more, scatters light much more because it's not flat. But if we change the filter and put some other color in it, it becomes even more obvious. And now here the wire bonds are also a little bit more obvious in how they are connected. It's a very nice in dark field. You can see, especially these with the so much gold, everything looks really pretty. And under a green filter, you really can now see the defect. There you go, this one turns completely black, and this one over here. Hopefully this will last a lot longer. By the way, this green filter is not done by the camera, it's done by the microscope itself. It's a very narrow field filter, I also have a few different colors, and sometimes you can bring out features uh, under those conditions.
And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do let me know in the comment section what you thought about the format, the amount of details that I went through. These obviously videos take a very long time to put together, but your feedback would be very helpful. And of course, if you want to support the channel through Patreon, the link is in the description. I'll see you in the comment section.